Hello, DevConf. Thanks for showing up here and more talk about code thrusting, or in more plain English, automating architecture governance, which sounds very dry, so I prefer the, f the primary name. All right, so uh, what's actually governing architecture? What does it really mean? What is this talk going to be about? Uh, so this will be a talk about the architecture, but not about design patterns, not about coming up with what's the best way to do microservices or something like that. It will be about how to execute your vision when you already have it in your mind. Because having an idea, having a picture, having a drawing, having a concept is not a success. It's only a drawing on a paper. It's just an initial idea and how you execute it and how you maintain it later. So your architecture goes live and it's maintainable. This is the hard part. This is, this is the lesson learned I was learning my whole life, my whole professional life. Here's a bunch of hashtags which refer to particular techniques and technologies I've used during projects which were the foundation for this talk. So if you are familiar with them, it, the talk may be actually be even more beneficial. Uh, who am I? My name is Sebastian Gemski. I work as a VP of engineering for a small uh, company that is revolutionizing beauty and wellness industry. Uh, we write code in Elixir. Hopefully anyone here is familiar with this language, but majority of work that was a foundation, that was a basis for this talk was in .NET. Uh, I'm also a blogger and you can find my contact info here. Feel free to use it. Um, okay, so let me tell you a story. <laughs> it happened not that long time ago. Uh, I was changing jobs. So I found a new client. Uh, they had money. They had plans. There was a lot of sexy buzzwords flying around. So next generation, new user experience, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And they just needed someone senior and technical who will be able you know, to execute this vision. So why not? <laughs> why not? Uh, so the first thing I did was I looked under the hood and I found the great evil, which they've called backend. And it's not like I wasn't warned about that. It's more like uh, they said that we had a little bit of technical depth, and, uh, but that's not the point. Uh, uh, this was not the technical depth. This was just bad engineering. Uh, these two are very, very, very different. Uh, but I could just pretend it's not there. <laughs> I could just pretend it's normal. So right now, let's do this new UX or new next generation, whatever. But you know, what really defines us as architect is tackling the real life problems and not building green fields. So I said that, wow, I can like build for you this new machine learning AI stuff. But in the meantime, let's deal with the real problem that is really pulling this platform under the water. So let's, I really like this comic book. Let's fuck the glacier. So I've started with just the first step. Let's try to entangle this whole thing. Let's try to tackle this great evil and fix the architecture, which was being continuously broken for more than 10 years. And I found that we actually cannot do it gradually because it's more like a burning platform and there are some urgent actions that have to be taken. And my reaction was, uh, I was joyful. <laughs> I was happy because like I said, it's the challenges that define us. Everyone can just go to the web and find the, another tutorial, Hello World tutorial and create another Greenfield ASP.NET Core project. This is easy, but dealing with the real problem, the bad engineering that was built up continuously for 10 years and solving this problem by proper architecture applied in a proper way, this is the reason to really you know, uh, think about, about yourself highly. So uh, this is basically how I was, I was treating it. So Michelangelo has his uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling and I thought, oh my God, this may be my Sistine Chapel ceiling. So I already had uh, the whole big picture in my head, how I will decompose the whole thing, split it into components, services, and things like that. And I already conceptually divided it into layers. So this will be my future layers. This is how it's gonna look like. I was already thinking about the facades. So this is how we are going to split the good new thing and bad old thing. You know, I already seen this anti-corruption layer before even the first line of code was put. And everything of that, this is important, was in my head <laughs> yet. It was just the concept of how I will create this whole thing. And this was the easy part. 
now the hard part came. People! <laughs> because this all was just in my head. And I joined this company and there were 80 or 90 developers. They had a huge turnover. These, those people, many of them very new from different locations, speaking different languages in different time zones, uh, with different you know, luggage of experience. And right now, uh, myself, as some sort of CTO, the main architect, I had to sell out this vision and make this vision happen over the time, which has failed in this company for the past 10 years. This is the hard mission, not coming up with the idea and with pictures and drawings. So uh, this is basically how my work looked like. <laughs> As a, a single owner of this vision, I, was, I, I don't know how many of you remember this Soviet Union handheld games when you were a wolf and you were trying to pick up all those eggs uh, which were dropping faster and faster. So this is how my work looked like. I was just running between people, trying to educate them, sell, this, sell them this vision, convince them, uh, collect their feedback, and so on, so on, so on. It was completely crazy. And... That's when I've decided, then when I found some kind of parallel that I want to do it in a way that corresponds to this code foresting concept that was already growing in me. And then I came up with some additional tools and techniques which I found supportive. And this is what this presentation is about. But first, before we get to the tools, some theory. Yes, it always starts with the theory. Uh, so the governance, Hopefully it's clear for everyone. The governance is managing, the, in this case of architecture, is managing the architecture long term. So making sure it really happens, it's sustainable, and it perceives in the future. So what are the problems with architecture governance? Well, I should start with the very basics, what is architecture, but I will spare you complex definitions, I, but I love this definition. I, have to, I had to share it. So basically, basically, architecture is a belief system. Each problem has infinite number of solutions, and there is no one single perfect solution. There are plenty of good enough solutions. So which one of the good enough is, is, is the one worth pursuit? The only thing that matters is that majority agrees, or hopefully everyone agrees. So it's like a belief system. If all of people believe in one version of architecture, in, in one particular solution, even if it has drawbacks, it doesn't matter if it's good enough. But the only requirement that they really have to believe in it, you really have to sell it out. Otherwise, it will just not work. So uh, why is it really that hard? There are so many reasons. Uh, of course, the, the different of experience is one of them. Then some people forget about conventions or whatever we agree. Some people just don't care. <laughs> uh, some people have this visage mentality that you are changing something they've done in the past. They had, you know, this parental attitude and they don't like it changed. Uh, some people have different goals. Uh, some people are really driven by their resume. So for instance, they only want to try new things just because they want their CV to look better and better so they can get better paid jobs. Uh, sometimes there's always the deadline pressure. So we instinctively lean toward the bad, the old solutions, the old way of doing things, not the new proposed architecture, just because it's easier or we're used to or we know how to do it the old way. There are plenty, plenty of reasons why it's so difficult to sell it out to the people and to execute the vision when, when it's conceptualized. Uh, one of the reasons which is really worth a separate slide is, is a Rashomon effect. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with that. There's an old samurai movie by Akira Kurosawa. And basically this movie is about a samurai who was wandering in the countryside with his wife and he died. He got killed. And there were plenty of bystanders, spectators who've seen the whole situation. And each of them is of different origin, of different social status, uh, has a different relationship with this samurai. And they've all seen the same scene, the same situation, but their personal bias make them believe they've seen something different. And they are completely honest about that, but they have completely different perception when they testify uh, to, the te to the deputy, police deputy. So, so this is what basically also happens very frequently in our technical discussions. We are speaking about exactly the same thing, but our personal bias make us say different things. So this is so very common. We usually refer to that 
subjective versus objective. It's very, very hard to be objective about the technology. Uh, so I rather rephrase it to opinions versus facts, that we are relatively safe in our technical discussions. If we stick to facts, there is, it's more problematic when we refer to opinions. And this is one, one advantage machines, machines have over people, that machines are based on facts and opinions. But oh, I will refer to it later. Another interesting thing that really doesn't help in uh, building or executing large concept designs in a big teams is the word assume, the word assume. is the worst verb on the planet. It, had, it should be absolutely banned. Why? Because we are assuming all the time. We are assuming that, for instance, if I put something in the document, everyone will read it, which doesn't happen. We assume that if there is a definition of done, it will be always done. We assume that everyone uh, executes the performance test after every chunk of functionality is changed. We assume too much. We assume because we are conceptually lazy. We don't want, we don't want to spend time on confirming. So this is why we assume. And when, when, when it comes to assuming, uh, this is one of the, more, the worst examples of assumption. Actually, it sounds much better in Polish. I've explained it to you already. And the emphasis is on the verb explained. What does it mean? That I've just told you something and you didn't raise any questions, so I assume that you understood it in exactly the same way I, I really meant. <laughs> but the words are just words. So they can be understood in so many different ways that if you just assume that someone has no questions so everything is perfectly clear, most, most likely you're failing. Another big scene, another big assumption that is really, really usually failing, especially when, when we are speaking about the infrastructure code of the architecture, is that it will be faster when I do it myself over the weekend. So yeah, I know this is the complex part. This is the core of our architecture. So don't worry, you little minions. I will do it over the weekend. So you don't worry, you will just add views and controllers and so on, so on, so on. How does it help? <laughs> if people don't understand this architecture, then whenever there will be a need for troubleshooting in future, they will fail because they, don't, they just don't understand it. Not, not mentioning even the ownership. So there are plenty of fallacies why it's so hard but how to make it better. So what are the laws of architecture governance that you should stick to? Obviously, the first one is communication. And it's not really technical. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, it's, tools can help, but tools will not replace other, other, other forms of communication. So it's how you communicate, how much you communicate, what kind of means you use to communicate, and so on. So communication is far more important than anything else. Then, uh, I really like this saying that one surgeon is worth three generals. So it's the leadership in the trenches. So if there's just one owner, an architect in the ivory tower, and it's only him who understands the architecture, this, this, will, this whole thing will fail. You have to have uh, some kind of sellout in the field, in the teams, in the trenches. So there are people who really embrace the concepts and who really want what you want to conduct to have the whole thing succeed. The ownership. It's not possible that someone will create 200 pages of some ideal, ideal architecture and then it, the, he or she will hand it out to the people and they will just implement it and we will ha live happily ever after. This is just not happen you have to spread the ownership. So the best architects, what they do, they either set the final goals or criteria how to meet these goals. So they don't tell you exactly what to do, but how they will evaluate what you do. This is also very, very, this is what really, really helps. And this, this is interesting. I uh, think that gets usually forgotten or, or, or omitted that imagine that you are working with the brownfield. So there is um, some old part, some legacy part, and the new part we are building or transforming. And you're setting some kind of new conventions. So the important thing is that, well, these are new conventions, so they do not apply to the old part. So you have to be very, very clear where do they apply to avoid the broken window effect. That this is the new part of code, and here all the new conventions apply unconditionally. 
This is very important because otherwise people do feel really, really confused and, uh, and the rules are dead since, the, since they were born. Uh, again, this was already actually uh, spoken about during one of yesterday's talk that the less principles and rules you set up, the better. So if architecture is described as 200 pages document, no one will memorize all of that. But if you create 10 commandments of your architecture, so 10 basic rules, people will be able to make decisions on a daily basis just based on these rules. I've done it in the past. I was creating wallpapers with the rules. I was creating uh, even short videos. I was creating uh, posters on the wall and so on. So people, until people have started referring to these rules on a daily basis. And that marked the moment of when this was successful. Uh, one of our compatriots, this is Felix Dzerzhinsky. He was Polish, but he was a chief of secret police in the Soviet Union just after the revolution. So he had this interesting saying, the virai no provirai, which means uh, trust but, but check. So this also applies in terms of architecture, that if you are setting some kind of guidelines, rules or whatever, that even if you feel that people buy it, really, and they really believe it, they feel it makes sense, you have to establish some kind of mechanism to validate that and to provide them feedback, whether they are applying it correctly or not. So this, this whole thing, uh, this can be actually implemented in two ways. There are two key strategies. So you can validate the whole thing afterwards, for instance, in the form of a peer review, or you can set up constraints, for instance, in a form or of an opinionated framework, which will prohibit you from breaking the rules. But how, how, how can this can be done in practice? So uh, when I was thinking about that, when I was thinking about how to conduct the big changes in such a big team of different experience and so on, I came up with this idea of code foresting because I thought that the large code base, it's like forest or like a big garden, that you just need to tend it. You just need to walk there. You just need to be there. You just need to inspect it and find out whether everything is healthy, whether everything grows because the code grows whether there are some kind of diseases or not. Maybe there are poachers. Maybe there are some, some part of the wood is, is getting dry, so it, there, it needs some more dehydration and so on. So it's exactly like with the code. You, you can identify the pieces of code that are more, more sick than the older ones. And if the code base it gets large, one single code for, uh, forester, just like in this picture, it, it's, it's, it's actually quite hard to tend to the whole forest. So how to do it, how to make it scale, especially if you are new in the team and your job is not only to execute the architecture, but also to build up the proper uh, cap capabilities in the team. So uh, to make it happen, this is like the first rule, the first fundamental rule. There are three monkeys and these three monkeys hug. They hug for a reason. They hug because architecture, docs and code, they have to correspond to each other as close as possible. Simon Brown is speaking and writing a lot of about, about that in his book. Uh, architecture, if it remains as a document and it doesn't correspond directly to the code, then it's dead. But if the constructs you have in your vision of architecture, in your documents, dry diagrams, whatever, if they appear exactly in the code and you can find the same relationships, the same dependencies, it means that you've really implemented the architecture. So the closer you keep these terms, the closer you keep architecture, code and documentation, the better, because then the chance they will diverge is smaller, right? So once you, once you have them really as close as, as possible, then you can identify the deviations. And if you identify them, you have to do it really, really quickly so you can react that, for instance, this particular new piece of code, new commit, is against the rules we've set up, and if you identify and if you report it quickly enough, you can sanitize it. And you should sanitize it very, very quickly to make sure that you are really, you're not really diverging from the vision that you've, you've proposed initially. And to do it efficiently, you have to do it in an automated way. Because it's, you either have a well-educated squad of proven people that you really trust. You've built things together and they have a necessary experience then the automation and the tools are far less important. But if you're lacking them, then you need to look for support for automation support. So uh, 
let me let me right now move uh, transition uh, make a transition to the part of how we actually apply these principles and i will split this into five parts or rather five plus one parts these five parts five pillars are basically the let's say small topics of how we did particular things and the pink uh, and the orange part the continuous inspection is how we linked merge them together, glued them together, so they worked uh, in the continuous inspection loop within our continuous integration. So these five parts are securing the perimeter, so separating old from new in a clear way. The communication, I don't think it requires additional comments. Expressive code. What is expressive code? Uh, well, if you are working with the code, the code is basically based on syntax of particular language. And this syntax is low level. But when you're speaking about patterns like gang of four patterns or DDD patterns or whatever, these are different concepts. Adapter, breach, anti-corruption liar. These are not present in C sharp. But in some way, for instance, if you assume, if you set up at the convention that data should be accessed via repository, you would like to validate that, that all the data is accessed via repositories, right? So you need to beat some kind of constructs in your code that represents the repository. So this is what does expressive code means. We are making our code more expressive to make it very, very clear what is repository and what is not. Convention testing is the next step over the expressive code. So once you have expressive code that represents your architecture, then you can validate your conventions that really all the data is accessed via repositories, because this is something that, for instance, you would like to test. And point number five, you would actually like to have a documentation, but the smart documentation, not the documentation you have to create manually because you never do, but the documentation which is a side effect of your work. It's just created because the work happens. It's just based directly on the code and metadata that accompanies the code. And then it's also additional source of knowledge about your code. These are the five pillars. And if you glue them together in a smart way, in continuous inspection, in the continuous integration loop, then you have a fast feedback, and then you, have to, then you can make this whole thing happen automatically. All right, so let's go through them one by one. So securing the parameter. Uh, like I told you, in the case of the project I've mentioned, we didn't really have the green field. We had something more like that. And we, we are crawling out of the mud. But the mud was very important. We couldn't get rid of the mud. Why was that? Uh, we had to reuse as much of the old logic as possible. And uh, there were some problems with that. Because the logic was that .NET solution with more than 200 projects the compilation took like a lot of time and it was like so super coupled that it was not possible to splice it into small parts. So uh, of course, in theory, we could just add some bunch of new projects to this solution, but the developer experience was so slow on the modern machine that it took like three seconds to do any action in ID, which is not acceptable. So we had to do something about that. So what, what to do? Uh, well, the first thing we've done is we've created the spike model for the new architecture. So we had the skeleton where to put the new code. And then we had to orchestrate the old new separation. Basically what we did, if crea we've created new solution for five or seven projects in the new architecture. And then we had to face the important answer. How we do we want to move between old and new? Of course, there are several ways to do this. We could expose the RESTful API from the old part. We could package it into NuGets and so on, but all of them were very, very faulty. There were problems with them. So what we actually did, we've used a build orchestration tool. There is a tool named Cake. I really recommend it. It's a C Sharp make, and it's a build orchestration tool that operates conceptually over the level of solution in Visual Studio. So. Uh, this tool actually is, is a scripting tool, so you create scripts in C-sharp, and then you have tasks for everything. You can have tasks to, for compiling stuff, working with NuGets, zipping stuff, running tests, and so on. So what we did, 
we were we used the scripting tool to script the old part to generate uh, to to verify whether there is there are new commits in the source control, so to make the recompilation of the new part as rare as possible, and then we were manually not manually but in the scripts we are moving artifacts the only the artifacts we were we are really in the need of to the new solution. So someone who was working only with the new solution. He was working in Visual Studio only with these five or seven projects, and where there was some action required that touched the old stuff, it was Cake which told him or her that. That was, that was actually much easier than we thought initially, just because the Cake has so many additional smart tasks. So it can integrate with Slack, with Git, or any kind of other source control, with Jira, or any other kind of seer tracker, whatever you prefer. Uh, so, actually, I don't have any screenshots here, but uh, in general, you could work with that in console, you could work with any ID, with Visual Studio, with uh, Visual Studio Code, even in Rider. I, I think I will have some screenshot later in the, in the final part. All right, uh, what about communication? Uh, this is the most important part, but this is also the most general, and you can find plenty of material. So, I will just mention a few points, and I will not cover this in, in detail. So basically, the leadership in the trenches were very important. So making all the tech leaders in the teams in sync. Uh, pro propagating the culture of building a healthy knowledge base. This is very important. There are so many organizations failing. There are so many, so many organizations that propose some kind of workflows of acceptance when you are trying to add an article to wiki or something. This, this doesn't work. This is not smart. You have to do it in a healthy, reasonable way. Examples, examples for everything. Example is worth 20 pages of the documentation. Example is actually much better than the documentation. And uh, the, the so-called Spotify model was mentioned so many times during this conference, but, uh, I, and I'm not going to like uh, give you an advice to copy it or something like that, but just check what they did and think about what could be applicable in your scenario. Because the concepts of uh, Gills or whatever they call it, chapters, or the concept of chapters is actually very smart. And in a, this form or different, it can be applied in an organization. Uh, another interesting thing is the concept of ladders. Ladders st st stands for lightweight architecture decision record. So each time when there's a decision, technical decision made, it should be ac actually kept in some kind of lightweight storage. So then la as a change log, so then it can be browsed and searched for. And Another, another helpful idea is the information radiators, where people which are interested in a particular technical area can subscribe to this area and they automatically get all the updates in this particular area. So there are plenty of concepts. The communication is very important. Smart added communication, direct communication, so that the knowledge really propagates. Other one, otherwise, you cannot just communicate via the documents. It just cannot be. Okay, let's get a little bit more technical. So I've already told you what I mean by the expressive code. Uh, how, how actually to create the expressive code? Obviously the first and the most easiest way is just use the naming convention. So the repository has to its name which ends by repository. But there are three additional techniques which are a little bit more smarter and easier to validate. The first one is about annotations or in .NET about attributes about metadata, which you add, which is the code, but which is not actually running. So it's uh, additional information that it's, it's attached to the code. Uh, there are conventions uh, like marker interfaces that also describe what's particular role of the particular code. And there's metaprogramming. You can actually create a DSL, but in .NET actually it's, it's, it's not that convenient or, or barely possible. So I will show you a few conventions which may actually seem quite controversial, but these are just examples. On, the, on this particular project, we had plenty of them. So the first one is usually the most controversial. Uh, it's an attribute. It's named Fixit. And Fixit is a ticket. So this is something that you would normally put in Jira. And this Fixit, this ticket, is the technical one. That architecture is broken here. Some kind of rule is broken here. And so... The reasonable question is, why the hell are you doing this? <laughs> uh, Jira is supposed to serve us as this kind of tool. Why, why are you putting this directly in the code? So the point is that if, if there is an, an issue in the code and you put it in Jira, it, once a person touch, touches this code, 
he or she doesn't know about this incident because it's somewhere in the backlog, <laughs> somewhere deep, and everyone forgets about it. But if, if this person is actually working with this code, working with this class, then it's really hard to omit this because this is so visible, because this is directly in front of their eyes. So there's a higher chance that they will actually fix it. And this works. <laughs> like honestly, I will not encourage you to do this for all the business issues or functional issues, but uh, in terms of the technical issues, it really, really works. Another example, which was like super useful, uh, it is about the service. So we have here the interface, which represents the service. And you know, usually when you are designing a service and it's persistent, there's some kind of persistence behind, uh, there's some data structures, they should be owned exclusively. So right now, what we are communicating is that this particular service owns these three or four tables. And again, you can question that, dude, these are just strings. <laughs> what, what if a typo happens? What if I create another service and I put exactly the same name? But rest assured that we're just getting started. This is only the expressive code. It's the convention testing that will validate whether this is true or not. Another interesting example, uh, and that, well, another interesting example is this golden sample. And what is golden sample? Golden sample is an example. <laughs> uh, so basically, we're also marking the referential pieces of code, which really represented the idea we wanted code to look alike. So for instance, this particular controller was, this is, if you don't know how to build a controller, start looking here, it's a good example. This is something that has a stamp of approval. So these are just few examples of how we use the annotations and how we used how we made code more expressive. But how we did, we do, did we do the convention testing and how actually the convention testing looks alike? Uh, so there are plenty of conventions to be tested, to be honest. So naming, coupling, dependencies, boundaries, uh, how the interactions look alike. Um, I will. I think that the best way to illustrate it actually is to look at the framework from the Java world. This is named ArchUnit, and actually I think it's quite fresh. Uh, but I think it's striking clear when you see the code. So before I even show you the code, uh, remember the convention testing treats your code base, your functional code base, as data. So uh, here's a piece of Java code. If you don't know Java, don't worry. This is very, very explicit. So what we are doing here, we are collecting classes from this particular package. Nothing really fancy, just a bunch of classes in the package. And right now we are defining a rule and the rule is very, very easy to, to read. So all classes that reside in this particular package should only be accessed by any package from this list. Sounds like one of the rules we set up. If we set a structure, if we set some kind of layers, we say explicitly, repositories only from services, but not web API, no, 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 no. Yeah, so this is basically that rule that checks this up for us automatically. So we don't have to focus on basics like that in our code reviews. And of course, everything with this sexy fluent API. Here's another example. Classes that implement connection should have simple name ending with connection. I don't even have to declare what it does, right? <laughs> it's just a basic naming convention, but you just have this one line, or two, sorry, two lines, and it does the hard job for you, the, the, let's say the, the heavy lifting for you. And ArchUnit provides some rules on the higher level of abstraction because it explicitly can operate not of the bunch of classes, but on layers. So there is a layer controller defined by service, persistence, and so on. And here you define the relationship between these layers, the which layer can be accessible from what. So ArchUnit is very fancy, but ArchUnit is Java. We didn't have ArchUnit. <laughs> so we had to create ArchUnit ourselves. <laughs> And of course, uh, we didn't really want to do it from scratch because it takes a lot of time and we want it fast. So we used two tools. The first one is NDPAND. NDPAND, I think that many people know NDPAND. It's proprietary, so you have to pay for it. And it's quite expensive, actually. Uh, and it doesn't provide such sexy fluent syntax. It provides CQL, code query language, which actually, in practice, it's very similar. But... Uh, it's very opinionated, and this tool was created over many, many, many years, so it has some sort of conceptual framework behind. But the problem is that this code doesn't really recognize the idea of expressive code. So for instance, it pretty much completely ignores the attributes. It doesn't care about your conventions. It only cares about code 
as you know a, a bunch of syntactical elements that correspond to each other. So that's, that's, and depend was not flexible enough. But uh, here are some examples of how the CQL looks alike. So here is the first, the first rule and how it really works. Uh, in this particular, first we are collecting some types, and we are doing this from the assemblies, which name meet something. Sorry for obfuscation. Contract, and then we are from this assembly. We collect the child types. So these are all the types we have in this assembly. Then we are filtering them. We are picking up only interfaces, and then for these interfaces, we validate which one of them. We validate their names. Which one of them do not match this? pattern for the name with the white cards. So this is another naming convention test, how, where the, in which namespace the interfaces should be put, and uh, what is the naming conventions for the actual interface name. So this is quite basic, right? This one is more, a little bit more interesting. So what we are doing here, we also collect the types, but we collect the types from web API, so from the HTTP exposing library, and then we pick up only controllers. So we are looking only for the types which derive from ASP.NET Core MVC controller. And then for all the controllers, we validate each one of them are using something from the assembly, something domain. So it means that we are looking for the controllers which do not use services, but access directly our domain objects, which were forbidden by our conventions. So this is how we were building the rules in NDPAND. This is how we are validating our architecture in NDPAND. Uh, you can say that, oh my god, this is just a string, a long string in the, in the, uh, in the parameter of the attribute. Uh, this is a separate discussion and it's actually not that painful as it, as it seems. There was a bigger problem. That the output of NDPAND is actually all those diagrams, which are very opinionated, but they are for manual grokking. It means that as a person, you can execute the report and then you are reading the outcome, but you have to evaluate the outcome and do the action yourself. So it's really hard to automate. But fortunately, what the NDPEN does, it, it can, all its output can be also put in the XML file. And what you have right now on the screen, you don't have to read this, I just wanted to show you the scale. This is the whole schema of this file. So it's not that complex. This is something that you can really work with. Uh, so again, what we did, just to make it possible to parse these outcomes of the NDPEND files, was we started to use F-sharp and type providers because type providers are so easy if you want to, uh, if you want to work with uh, complex types. So with a little bit of F-sharp code, literally, this is the code which is right now on the screen, and there will be a link to the presentation at the end, so you'll be able to check this in detail. With just these two functions, you are able to extract all the rules from the independent outcome output files. So then, for each rule, you just have to create such a small function to extract it from, from the independent report file. So basically, once you have the engine in place, you, have, you just create another CQL rule, you just create this four-liner in F-sharp, and you can extract it in, for instance, do anything you want with the output of the broken rule in F-sharp, and later in PowerShell, and in whatever you want, for instance, in continuous inspection loop. Sadly, NDPEND doesn't work with what I called expressive code. It cannot recognize the attributes. So we had to get deep down into Roslyn. And this is painful. Hopefully everyone knows, Roslyn is the platform SDK. It's for C-sharp and VB.net. It's very low level. I mean, by very low level, I mean AST trees, you know, the semantic model and so on. So it's painful if you really want to write, create sophisticated rules. So just to show you the scale, this piece of code, which is much more than previously, is used only to extract enums from the part of semantic model. So it's not doing anything with them yet. It just extracts them. And then you have to transform, verify whether they have, the, for instance, uh, the correct structure, the correct naming convention, and so on. So in our case, we are using a lot of uh, Roslyn just to extract the attribute information from the code to validate the, whether our expressive code meets our conventions. Okay, so we had, we had 
the, our ways to create expressive code. We had our ways to test them or at least extract data using Roslyn and NDPend. What about the documentation part, the living documentation I've mentioned? So the documentation as a side effect. So what does it really mean, documentation as a side effect or the living documentation? So uh, it means that documentation is supposed to be evergreen. Evergreen means always up to date. So if it has to be always up to date, it cannot be updated manually because then it doesn't happen. <laughs> so it means that it has to be a side effect of the work. So what does it mean side effect of the work? That it has to be generated out of code and the metadata that ac accompanies the code and possibly the tests if you are using the, some particular frameworks. Uh, and it's funny because this, this book was actually meant by, uh, mentioned by, I think it was burnt from uh, uh, Kamunda today. This is a great book about the, all the concepts of living documentation. By, it, the book is by Cyril Matre. You can find it, uh, for instance, on LeanPub. I really recommend this one. It's striking good. So to create living documentation in .NET, we've used uh, the tool named DocFX. It was created originally by Microsoft. I think they open sourced it some time ago. Uh, what it can do, it actually, this is some sort of uh, Doxygen or Javadoc clone, if you remember the old times where Doxygen and Javadoc were used. So what it, what it can do, it can create documentation out of code, but it can also it also recognizes additional content in form of Markdown documents. So you can mix these two things. You can put Markdown directly with your code side by side, and you can link them, you can keep them in one single structure. So you can, for instance, update the documentation using the same commit, you used to update the code and the tests, which is exactly the idea. You can also embed static content, for instance, picture that you put in into this documentation. And you can either generate the static files that you later put on the web server. So for instance, uh, I think I've used uh, Nginx or that for that or, or whatever, or, or it, can, it can be also safe hosted, which, which is also an option. So how does it look alike? Yeah, basically, you can create articles using a basic markdown Hopefully everyone knows the markdown syntax. It's very, very simple. You create DOC, table of content files, just to show what kind of hierarchical structure you would like for your documentation. And then voila, this is all. And you just specify which part of code you want your documentation generated from. And then you have a site, a complete site, uh, where your markdown is translated to HTML, when you have the whole structure, this whole tree of documentation which you've put in TOC files, and for each document you are browsing, you can have also the structure of the document, so easily, it's easily browsable. There is a search capability, uh, you can access the API for the uh, automated gener automatically generated documentation for code here, and all the articles here, and you can put this in the CI loop, and it can be auto-generated after each commit. Uh, this is the piece of auto-generated documentation for one particular method, which is named this method does, no, does nothing. <laughs> and uh, whatever document, whatever comments you have in your, you know, triple dash syntax, it's also put automatically in the documentation. So for instance, here for all the parameters, you also have their description just because it was put in the comments. And it's, it's present automatically. You don't have to do it manually at all. All right, so uh, what I said, I've mentioned some tools and this work, uh, how do they work together? So how to make as much as possible out of them together, how to glue them? So we're thinking a lot about that, that we, we somehow had to integrate it. So for instance, to auto-generate the documentation based on the code, which was validated using the convention test and so on. So we, uh, we decided to create two tools, which were uh, named Hugin and Munin. If you know the Nordic mythology, these are two ravens of Odin, thought and memory, which were bringing him all the information, so he knew everything which was happening in the world. And this was uh, our intent in this project. We wanted to know who is breaking the rules <laughs> in the moment when he or she was breaking them. Uh, so how did we create these tools? Uh, we are scripting in PowerShell because it's so convenient in .NET uh, world. There was a lot of tackling with data, the functional tackling with data in different formats. So we use type provider to speed it up. And if type providers, then of course F sharp, uh, even for the interacting with independent roles, in, which, which was actually quite painful. And we've used a nice library uh, named argue. This is the functional declarative library for handling input, which worked perfectly with F sharp. 
the basic architecture was like that, that we had two passes. The blue code is the F sharp code. The first pass, it was uh, in the first pass, it was possible to run Rosin extraction, independent extraction, or DB extraction to extract the valuable information that we uh, put in the JSON intermediary files for the actual rule transformation engine, which was the second pass. So why to split it into two passes? Because the first one was so time consuming. Because for instance, what Roslyn does is loads the whole project, compiles it in the memory, and then you can do your heavy lifting, then you can do your transformation. So sometimes it made it more sense to do this only once, uh, and then just to, for the second part, to uh, work on the intermediary files. For, for the convenience, I've merged all the F-sharp stuff in the single block, but what we did uh, as, the as the next step, we've wrapped that in a PowerShell, let's say, uh, wrapping. So we're converting the output to PS object. So it was possible, for instance, to make queries from the PowerShell where we are filtering particular rules to make it even more, even more flexible. And in the end, like I mentioned in the beginning, we're wrapping everything in cake tasks. So right now, our continuous integration server was able to either update the documentation based on the outcome, uh, or for instance, stop the, uh, stop the actual build or stop the actual deploy because of the broken tests. So this is basically, this is why all this functionality, all this rule engine was accessible directly as a console application in F, F Sharp as the PowerShell scriptlet, which uh, it was quite convincing, uh, it was quite convenient because you had your PS objects to deal with, or as a cake task, and this was most convenient for the continuous integration. So uh, here are some screenshots, hopefully this is visible. So what we, are running, what we are doing here, we are running a cake task named find illegal entities. So find us, our entities. Entities are, this is, you know, the DDD terminology. So we're looking for entities which were actually uh, uh, used by the services out of their area. So it was possible to run just one cake task from Visual Studio or for the console. And what you have here is the list of the, of the entities which are breaking this particular rule. And right now, uh, as you can see, it took only one second for the whole solution, which is quite neat just because we did the smart scripting in, the, in, the, in that cake, so we're doing the, the actual analysis only on the separated new part. So this is how it looks from the console perspective. Uh, this is also from the console perspective, but he, actually we have here the transformation to PS objects, so we are running the familiar, hopefully for you, uh, PowerShell uh, filtering and querying and so on and so on. So right now we are also querying some broken rule. Uh, as it's PowerShell, you can, for instance, dub its, its content to outgrid view. So you can do all the filtering, uh, searching, sorting, and whatever you want in, in the visual window. And like I said, we're also auto-generating the documentation. So all the, uh, the rules which were broken were also put automatically after the broken commit in the documentation. So just after the commit, we were able because this was in cake, we are able to run the cake task to notify on Slack the abuser, dude, you've just broken the rule. We're putting this in the documentation with the owner of who was responsible for this broken rule because of who did the commit. And uh, like we literally could do anything we wanted. We could even have created automatically the, 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 the incident, the issue in Jira, if we wanted at this point. So... Uh, this whole was completely automated. So each time there was a commit, we did our uh, analysis using both Roslyn and, uh, and, and Depend, and also the database. Because like I show you the, showed you in the beginning, we're for instance putting for the services which data structures are owned by this service. So what we did, we were actually dumping the structure of the database to validate whether these tables really exist and the, whether we, are, we have some abusers which claim to own the same data structures, but these are different services and so on. So in this way, because you know, for instance, the rule of clear explicit isolation that this service owns this data structure, this is very fundamental. If you are breaking that, you have some additional coupling, you are breaking the boundaries uh, between the components in your system. And sometimes it's actually quite tricky to validate. 
and with such a help in automation that is works on the data that is extra, extracted directly from the code, it's really hard to cheat the machine. It's always possible because you can outsmart the game, especially if you have access to the code, right? But uh, well, it's it's always you know the price of it's always effort versus value gained. So uh, let's get to the final part. How did it end? It uh, to be honest, we've created around 40 or 50 rules and the whole thing was running, but I cannot give you the explicit answer. How did it work? Because to evaluate it, it, it should be running on production for half a year or more. And to be frank, I've left this company before such a period of time. So I cannot tell. Probably people who are still there will be able to tell. Uh, but uh, I, it doesn't mean that I don't have any lessons learned. I have a few of them I would like to share. So. Uh, in this case, I've decided to do it to prepare it as quickly as possible. So I've decided to do it in F-sharp. And this was a stupid idea. Why so? Because there were a few people who were capable of writing F-sharp code. For many people, this was scary. So trying this single-handedly as some evening work, <laughs> additional, which required additional capacity, is actually quite stupid. Don't do it. Of course, but fortunately, I was aware of that. Even the smartest tool do not replace the communication. So you have to evangelize. If you are building some kind of, some sort of architecture, you have to evangelize, you have to get the buy-in, you have to delegate the ownership in the in a let's say uh, voluntary way, not in the first way. Technically creating such a convention tool even without the arch unit is not a big deal. So we have all the building blocks. As I, I've just proved it's possible. It really worked. So it's only about some kind of discipline and respecting the outcomes of these tools. Introduce it, if you want to go for such a thing, introduce it gradually. Don't start with 100 rules. Because if you have 200 abusers since the day one, everyone will just ignore the outcome, right? But if you start with the small number, then people will feel that this is a big deal, so let's fix it. Fast feedback is crucial. So if you are getting your feedback to the people one day after the commit has happened, uh, they will tell you, oh, okay, right now I'm working on something else. I will get back to that. Well, maybe next week because we have sprint commitment and so on. So the fast feedback, just like with the continuous integration, the fast feedback is absolutely crucial. All right, uh, that's all I have prepared for today. Uh, if you have any more questions, this presentation is available online. Here's the link. Uh, if you have any questions regarding that, uh, feel free to get me right now or after the conference or reach me on Twitter. Uh, there's also my, uh, my contact information on my blog post, on my blog page, which is, address is put here. So thank you very much.